Timothy Egan is an award-winning writer and a wonderful Irish storyteller. Enjoy this two-part presentation, Mr. Egan discussing his new book, The Immortal Irishman, at the American Irish Historical Society. The room was a bit dark, but his words sparkled brightly. This is a story for all of us to appreciate, whether you are Irish or not. And this is the dawn of the first great movement of people from one shore to the other. We'll later see Italians, we'll see Poles, we'll see Jews from Eastern Europe, we'll see all the different, we'll see every part of the earth will eventually send their people to America. But this is the first big wave. Remember the family. A million die, but 1.5 million leave. And they leave in these coffin ships. It's 10 pounds to leave, but Coffin ships, they call them that because there's often caught typhus on the way over. What most people don't realize is when many of those ships were on the shore, they were orphans because their parents had died. One in five died in the first couple of years of the ship, mainly because of typhus, which is a disease that spreads in close quarters. And most of the Irish, they're rural peasant people. They don't go any more than a few blocks from the Lower East Side. They land here at the bottom of this island and they cram into these horrible tenements. So I'm going to read a short section here about what it was like in 1852, Thomas Mars' first day in America. The word had gotten out, and it just ricocheted around the Irish American press that their savior, Mar of the Sword, had not only you know, defied his death sentence, but now he'd beaten the British Empire in Tasmania. So they were expecting him. They, were, they, were expect, they called him savior. They thought at some point he would come. So here he is on his first day. He had seen half the world from a ship's deck, and yet nothing prepared him for how many of the Earth's uprooted strivers had stuck themselves in the New York City of 1852. Carriages dashed and shifted, horses clopped and whinnied. Stevedores grunted and cursed all in waves, not the music of commerce, but the off-key chorus of chaos. There were boatmen and ferrymen, there were porters and carters and stage drivers, there were washerwomen, there were predators of immigrants, there were domestics walking other people's children, and there were teenage girls in face paint handing out flyers for the afternoon melodrama in the Bowery. Was that the Teutonic Tongue coming from Kleindeutschland, the third largest German-speaking community in the world? And was that Yiddish rising from the cluster of rag brushes a few blocks in the other direction? And what hybrid of the Queen's English was this dialect of free blacks working dockside. Surely a hint of County Kildare clattered from that street cleaning crew, and his own Munster brogue rolled out of a basement shabeen. All of this was in the kinetic claustrophobia of the Lower East Side, nursery of a nation whose people were looking less like those of the mother country by the day. Around one turn, the smells were unpleasant in the late spring humidity, sweat trying with horse shit, dog shit, Ship, the piles to be swept away into the river by day's end, 6,000 cartloads a night. A few blocks on, he was hit by a lot of a more pleasant smell, the fresh cooked offerings of barefoot girls who enticed customers with cries of hot corn, get your hot corn. This island of Manhattan was smaller than the prison district where Thomas Francis Mark had been condemned to spend the rest of his life. And yet, it held a world of fellow exiles, from Russia's from Rome's sweat villages, from the Rhine's ruined farms, from Africa's plundered hamlets, and from those passion blighted fields abandoned by those strong enough to walk away from Ireland's great hunger. On May 27th, the day of Eager stepped ashore, New York was home to 20,000 Jews, 12,000 African Americans, 60,000 Germans, and at least 160,000 Irish. It was the densest concentration of Irish anywhere on the planet. More than one in four New Yorkers in the city of nearly 6,000 had been born in Mars' homeland. Now he walked by City Hall, where to his pleasant surprise, men not long from Limerick or Kilkenny held actual power. He walked to Broadway, past the booksellers and the portrait studios, onward toward Canal Street, then right in the direction of the Bowery. On alternate days, bare knuckle boxing shared space 
with Shakespeare plays. A scattering of Irish soon became a thicket of Irish, but here they looked worn down and dirty-faced. Their tenements were awful, awful. Wooden jails that would combust in a proof of an untended cigar. Here were flop joints, groggeries, and a row of slouch roofed boarding houses anchoring one city block. Nearby was a former brewery, converted from making beer to warehousing immigrants. It was a home to a thousand people in this single tenement, some of them living in stairwells. The price was 37 cents a week, 37 cents a week. You could sleep in a windowless room on a floor with straw. For 18 cents a week, just the bare floor with a latrine. Which is one reason why I appreciate this space. <laughs> then he walks out to the stew of startled people. Five points. He knew this neighborhood, five blocks in the heart of the sixth ward by reputation. For Charles Dickens had come through years earlier, notebook in hand, two cops by his side. The novels were stunned to see the mixed races, Irish and blacks, drinking together, dancing in saloons, a born in America toe and heel tap that was a blend of Gaelic jig and West African step dance. That was the birth of tap dancing. In darkened corners, Mixed race couples kissed and groped. Where Anthony Orange and Crossmates came together, Dickens saw a place called loathsome, drooping, and decayed, for no part of London could match the wretchedness of this neighborhood. It was without grass or trees. It was without a sliver of green. And thereafter, tourists paid armed men to guide them through an evening of slumming among the poor Irish for a chance to be appalled at what the New York Times said, quote, shanties in which the pigs and the Patricks lie down together. They said this to a readership that was accustomed to bed in cleaner linen. That's my paper. <coughs> then not edited by Dean McKay. Um, good editor. So that's what Moore faced. He saw the good that some people had succeeded. He saw the awful. He was adrift. And he fell in love with the Fifth Avenue beauty, who was everything that he was not. Her name was Elizabeth Townsend, from the Sterling family that had done the Sterling Ironworks that put the chain over the Hudson. They were fabulously wealthy. They had a place on Fifth Avenue and an estate in New Jersey. And she was a wasp. She was, you know, as I said, a Protestant. She was everything that he was not. They absolutely fell for each other. And Moore wrote this letter to her. I found it in the Montana Historical Society. You know, when you get these historical figures, they're, they're, they're like statues. They're like busts. You don't think they're human beings. And I found this love letter, and it just made him a very vulnerable man. He writes this 10 page letter asking her to marry him. He says, I have nothing. His family wealth has not come his way. He can't go back to Ireland. He said, I'm a future. I'm an ex, I'm a convict, not even an ex convict. I'm a convict. I'm wanted by the British Empire. I have a price on my head. I'm all alone. I have no one here. But I love you more than anyone I've ever met. He said, if you will take me, if you will take up your life with me and follow me, I will treat you as an equal and everything we'll do. And so for the rest of their life they were together. They were like this. She went to all the Civil War. She went to his camps where people were dying and bleeding. She went west to Montana to live in a 200 square foot cabin with him. Her family renounced her. She lost all her wealth and everything. She took up with this Irish rebel, and they were lovers for the rest of their life. Very, they never produced a child, but they were. They had quite a passion, quite a passionate affair and, and marriage. Now the Civil War breaks up. No one knows which way the Irish are going to go. As Frederick Douglass said, in Ireland, I'm treated as a man. I'm not treated as a color. But he said once the Irish got to America, they picked up on American racism. They changed a little bit, and the reason was. They, were, they had the crappy jobs. They built the sewers. They built the you know, canals in upstate New York. They built the railroads. They shoveled that pig crap into the river. And they were told, if the largest slave-holding nation on earth, then the Confederate States, having taken that title from us, were to release or somehow free these four million slaves, you know what they're going to do? They're going to come up with two good jobs. So there's a real break in the Irish community, not with Mark. He sees the very first day the war breaks out that the Irish must fight and they must fight on the side of the Union. He said, this is the country, the only country in the world that totally took us in. Also, he says, 
This is a chance for us to prove our Americanness. He says, look at this, look at these men who've already given their lives for this country. So Abraham Lincoln does a brilliant thing. Now, Lincoln's a Republican, Moore most of the Irish are Democrats. He names Moore a general. Now, this is called a political general. The other generals look down on him. And he organizes the Irish Brigade right here out of New York City, the 69th, the Fighting 69th, which was a militia, New York City militia, predominantly Irish, then reconstituted as the Irish Brigade with recruits from all over the country. Now, people are saying, God, these Irish, they can't even organize a parade without fisticuffs. How the hell are they going to fight? <laughs> well, they quickly found out because Bull Run was the first big battle of the Civil War, barely 30 miles from Washington, D.C. The capital was under siege. People thought that slaveholders were just going to cross the river and take over the capital. The Union is routed at Bull Run. They run. They actually put down their guns and run. But the Irish didn't run. And Sherman, as much as he hated the Irish for all their other things, was so impressed that they did not run. So this cover, it hangs in the Museum of the History of New York. It's a mural half the size as this. It was undercover for a long time. This is Thomas Moore returning to New York City after that battle of Bull Run. He's triumphant. He started to give the country a different view of the Irish, that they will shed blood for this country that took them in. And that is perhaps his greatest achievement. So they fight in all the bloody battles of the Civil War. And, you know, they, they do things a little different. People notice this. Like I said, they stage plays in between the battles. They, you know, have these horse races. They, do recite epic poems, most of which involve martyrdom, and play their fiddles till four in the morning. There's a little drinking going on. And Mars' other pitch was, once we Irish Americans are done with the slaveholders, we will sail across the Atlantic, a fully seasoned army, and we'll kick England out of our We'll finally reclaim our homeland. Not people with pitchforks, which is what I call them pitchfork patties during this famine uprising, but seasoned soldiers with artillery, with weapons. That was the recruiting pitch, as well as that you can become an American. But they're absolutely wiped out. They, only two other brigades suffered a higher casualty rate in the Civil War than the Irish did. 160,000 Irish fought on the Union cause, on the Union side. And they died at Antietam, September 19, 1862, the bloodiest single day in American history. 23 thousand casualties on one day. The worst was Fredericksburg in December of 1862, which was um, the Confederates were behind a wall, about 50,000 of them, including Robert E. Lee. And the Union was down in a battle. And Ambrose Burnside had ordered the Irish Brigade to launch this huge surge of soldiers up this slope. Now, one of the wonderful things about this book, putting this book together, was to, to touch all the places that Mar touched to see this. And when you walk up that slope, you see, oh my God, there's just no cover. And they just got mowed down, just mowed down, just wave after wave after wave. This is where Robert E. Lee, because there was so much carnage, he famously said, it is well that war is so terrible, otherwise we should grow too fond of it. Now before this battle, you know, the Irish Brigade flag was a harp, which, of course, that was the martyr instrument that had been outlawed, and it was a sunrise. And before this battle, Mar told all the soldiers to put a little spring in boxwood under their forage caps. He said, I know it's going to be brutal, but when they find these bodies, they'll know we died as Irishmen. And they did die, and it was terrible for him. He wept on the field. He lost so many friends. And then he had to face so many widows and so many mothers that he personally had recruited. He was the greatest recruiter that Abraham Lincoln had because of his silky voice. So it, it, it demoralized him. He knew now they couldn't sail across the Atlantic and liberate England. He knew that, you know, the cause was not going to go any further than the American shores. But he also knew one other thing. What did they die for in Fredericksburg and Antietam? Lincoln announced on January 1st, 1863, what they had died for. The Emancipation Proclamation, four million slaves in the South, liberated. And Mar took that as the thing that the Irish Brigade had died for. It didn't always sit well. 
There were the draft riots, which you know, nearly burned New York to the ground. You know, mostly Irish going after blacks. They would have killed more. He would have been killed by fellow Irish during the draft riots. If he'd been here, they found this portrait and tore it to the ground and burned it. People were upset because the casting rate was so high that so many Irish were dying. But Marr took that for the rest of his life that we had died for the cause of free blacks. He went further than most of the progressives of the day. He advocated full citizenship, the 13th Amendment, when the 13th Amendment hung in balance. So he incorporated that into his cause. Now, the last part of his epic journey takes us to there's got to be a place for these people somewhere. He thinks it's going to be in Montana territory place 10 times bigger than Ireland. So he's named the territorial secretary. Lincoln intended to name him. Lincoln is assassinated in April. So the feckless Andrew Johnson then named him a few months later. He and Libby, Libby came slightly later. He went out first, took a six month journey to Montana territory. It was almost impossible to get there. Arrives in Virginia City, Montana, sits at 6,000 feet. There's garbage in the street, poop. There's a corpse hanging from a scaffold nearby. There's brawling men and women. And he's greeted by this well-dressed gentleman with his family on their Sunday clothes vest, the governor of Montana, who hands him a sheet of papers and said, Mr. Marr, you are now governor. I'm out of here. <laughs> and the governor takes the very stage that has brought Marr to Virginia City. So for the next two years, fugitive, rebel, Wanted by the British Empire, Mar of the Sword is the governor of the territory of Montana, the biggest territory at the time in the United States, Texas has already stated. And he does some amazing things. He tries to build a civilization from this raw bone place. He's given the joyless task of going out, rounding up the Sioux, then led by a very powerful chief. They had actually defeated the U.S. Army. And it was one of the few Indian battles where it resulted in the U.S. Army suing for peace. The Red Cloud had defeated the Americans. He's supposed to you know, line up the Flatheads, the Cheyenne, the Sioux, but he has no heart for it. Because he sees in the Indians, he tells us these Jesuit priests who were on the campfire one night, he goes, these Indians, you know, we, we're taking away their language, we're taking away their religion, we're taking away their land, how is this any different from what they did in Ireland? He sees the story repeating itself. He has no heart for the Indian battle. He later leads a, he's told by the president to lead the city in crusade, he doesn't kill a person. They never fire a shot, they just kind of go over there. Fake like they're fighting. Then he goes to his final journey to Fort Benton, Montana, and this to this day is one of the oldest mysteries in the American West, the last day of Thomas Francis Marr. What we know is that the worst outbreak of vigilante hangings had undergone had happened in those last two years. And these weren't your prototypical toothless brawlers who were doing these hangings. These were the right thinking citizens of Montana. These were the they were the Freemasons. They couldn't stand the Irish. They were anti-Catholic, they were anti-Irish. They grabbed people who they disagreed with and they strung them up without a trial. 37 executions by the time Marr was the second year of his governorship under a constitutional democracy where the constitution protects your right at least to a trial. These people were not even given a trial. So this one gentleman was picked up and they announced that he will soon be executed for a, a card game fight that did not result in a death, it was back and forth. And Moore grants the men a reprieve as the territorial governor. says, you can petition the president for a reprieve, for a full pardon, he gives him a reprieve. A few hours later, the vigilantes grab this guy and string him up. In one pocket is General Moore's reprieve, and in another pocket is a warning note of the hangman's who said, the governor is next. So we know he disappeared, but with my editor's help, I think we sort of solved one of the longest lasting mysteries of the American West. What happened to the great Mar of the Sword on that last day, July 1st, 1867, at Fort Benton on the Missouri River. So let me sum up his legacy. The Irish know who he is, and if you go into any bar in Montana or any church and you bring up his name, you'll start an argument, um, mainly about how he died. But most people don't know him. There are free people in Australia. There were free people in Australia, in part because of him. Because while he was serving his time, he wrote these polemics, these editorials, under a known de plume. And these things went out and helped 
the Australians the free settlers themselves to end the penal colony, to make Australia a fully functioning civilization, to not be just a dumping ground for convicts. So in part because of his campaign, the citizens voted while he was still there and still condemned to spend his life there to convert Tasmania and other places to something not resembling a penal colony. There certainly were free blacks in America, as he came to understand, because of the sacrifice of those men. Eventually, as you know, this is the 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1916, there would be a free island. As John F. Kennedy said when he retired in 1963, with Mars' words, with Mars' sword, with Mars' flag, he said, this is the, one of the oldest of civilizations and the youngest of nations. It didn't really become a nation until the mid 20th century. So there is a free island today, in part because of him. When the Eastern rebels started the revolution that took over Dublin in 1916, and took over because it was their hometown, Mars' words were resurrected. So people heard these words again, the patriots themselves passed them. So there's that memory. That's what Mark carried for most of his life. That's what many Irish Americans carry. We have put this memory to verse. We put this memory to song. It's embellished at times because you know, we like to embellish a little bit. But the Irish there are great believers. And you see it in Mars' story. That the best stories happen to those who can tell them. Thank you. <laughs>